Welcome to Rider Nation Station, presented by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistics partner, investing in Rider Nation Station and St. Mary's, Ohio, and to our other fine sponsors. Welcome back to another week of Rules of the Game. My guest is here, Mark Sisko. Thanks for coming back, Mark. Appreciate it, Zach. Thank you. I'm Zach Farrell, your host. I also wanted to thank Dave Weibacher for filling in for me last week. I uh, also wanted to just give a quick shout out to our viewers at home and a simple request for you. If you could at this time, go ahead and click the subscribe button there on our YouTube page. Also click the thumbs up. That'll help us share the video more and get more viewers so we can keep bringing you great videos here from the Rider Nation station. Good Mark? Day. Our first uh, generic to sort of talk today about officiating, I wanted to bring up how officials are rated by their okay. coaches every week and then how that rating and the different rating of the crews affects them in the playoff time. Yeah, um, each week the schools are, are charged with rating the crew and the officials uh, on a scale of, of one to five. Uh, five being best, one being not so not so best, so to speak. Um, sometimes the coaches do it. Sometimes the ads will handle those duties uh, only because of the the I guess the detachment somewhat by the ads um, takes it out of the coaches' hands because you know they're they're sometimes very emotional as they should be with their kids and everything, and sometimes they don't look at the the, the officiating of the game um, with a you know a dispassionate eye that maybe somebody else would. Um, the coaches have a vote. There are votes um, that are made at the at the OHSAA office. Um, there are votes made by local rules interpreters and secretaries. Um, even the local associations have a vote. They will vote internally, and then the results of those votes are added to all the other votes in a, in a in what I think is a complicated formula to come up with a a, a rating system. Is there a rubric that the coaches and ads follow, or is it just one? one rating scale uh, you know it's it's one rating scale um and again you know you, you could be on your game but you have a call that the coach doesn't like go against him even though it might have been the correct call that affects ratings right it shouldn't but it does and you know and there's no perfect way to do this um the only better way would be to have impartial observers at every game played in the state of Ohio and on every weekend and then even that would be subject to the individual's whims and everything else so there's no perfect way um, we live with it um, and, and we and we deal with it how does then that affect through playoffs so does the does the higher rated crews do they continue to go on each week or uh, yeah you know in theory that's probably how it should work but the the OSHA office has a has overall control so if they didn't feel that the, the the crew that may have been high, rated the highest was capable of you know the the division one game or two or three or whatever in the state finals, they have the discretion to move those folks around, and sometimes they do. Um, you know things would affect maybe a crew member was a uh, is associated with the local school system. Maybe they have a son or daughter playing or cheerleader. Who knows? There's a lot of things that can go into that, um, but. The higher the ratings, the, the, the more games you will get during the tournament period. And the uh, OSHA will take into account then whether the person is from a certain area? They will. We are required to fill out a, a it's called a survey before the season that says, look, if you're selected to, to work in the playoff system, is there any schools that you feel that you should not work? So it's up to the integrity of the official to fill that out. And as for somebody like me, I would probably put St. Mary's, right? And and maybe New Bremen from because I live there. My girls went to school there. And then if that, there was any games assigned that that I was to be a part of, they would probably move the entire crew to another game to accommodate you know the, the conflict of interest, so to speak. Makes sense. Well, very interesting stuff. I'm sure we could spend an entire day talking long, about it, probably. Wow. But we'll save some of that for a future episode, I think. Sounds good. Um, go ahead. We're going to take a quick break right here. On the other side of this break, though, we're going to have some clips from the Rough Riders' hard-fought victory against Van Wert. Okay. A lot of uh, interesting um, events happened in that game, So, and actually some things that we had talked about in previous episodes. So we're going to go over that here on the other side of this break. Good deal. Guidari's on Spring Street, home of the signature Big Ralph Sub, Pizza, and Calzone. Come try our thirst-quenching Rider Aid before, during, and after the game. 
post-game live music every Friday night. It's Gwinnery's. Give them a call, 419-394-2244. Welcome back to Rules of the Game with Mark Sisko. I'm Zach Farrell. We're going to go over a couple clips here, Mark. Uh, the first one here uh, is a face mask that was called on Van Wert on one of their defensive linemen um, by pulling, basically pulling the helmet off of one of the uh, St. Mary's offensive linemen. All right. So I wanted to take a look at it here. It's going to be number 62, um, right kind of in the middle of your screen. You can see him get up there, and oh, there, yeah. there goes the helmet the getting helmet ripped off. Big time right there. That just wasn't a little pull. That was taking the whole helmet off. That's pretty obvious yeah, right there. Yeah, you can see the flags thrown right away. Um, but – you know, one of the other uh, aspects of this is uh, we've heard, I know, in the r recent years that when helmets come off, that the player has to come out of the game. Right. Um, on the Rider Nation station replay of the game, you can notice that the number 62 starts to come off the field and the uh, official tells him to stay back on. What's the rule on that? Well, if the, if the helmet would have come off for anything other than a foul-related play, and here was a foul here because they called the, the Van Wert kid for – face mask or wherever if that's the case then with the helmet coming off the player whose helmet came off can stay in the game because of a transgression by the opposing team now if that play were to happen in the middle of everything and all of a sudden the, the helmet comes off and nobody could see how it got off yes 62 would have been required to to leave the game for at least one play um, that came about four or five years ago because there was a lot of instances where kids' helmets were just coming off. They wouldn't fasten them properly or securely, and every little bit we had a helmet coming off, and the National Federation said, look, we got to put a stop to that, and th that's what the rule was. A lot was of now. emphasis on concussions, and I know that Keeping having the, helmet the chin on strap on, have it right. Yep, yep, that sort of thing, correct. Okay. All right, well, um, next clip here we're going to have um, – this was from early in the game. This was on the Rough Riders' first drive. Uh, Ty Howell takes a sweep and um, runs it pretty far here about, uh, I think, 40, 45 yards. At the end of this play, you'll see the ball pop loose. Um, it was uh, – Ty Howe was called down on contact there. And we got a couple angles here that are uh, really interesting to me. Um, All right, well, let's take a look at the end zone view once. Maybe that will provide a little clearer look. There you can see number 12 break a couple tackles there. Really nice hard run. Oh, and the ball's out. So, initially, it looks like maybe the ball came out – He. It, was he down when he started to roll over the defender? We can't really tell for sure if there's an elbow that maybe touched down. Initially, it looks like maybe he's just rolling over, and as he rolls over the defender, the ball pops loose. In that case, if no other body part had touched down, either the hand or the foot, the ball would be considered loose at that point and a fumble. But it's a little hard to tell here whether we had an elbow or something else down, and the, 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 the rule basically is the ground cannot cause a fumble. Number, Mainly, so when the elbow touches, he's down. And right. whatever happens after that is, is inconsequential. So tough to tell. The officials are right there on it, and we have to even – we've tried to slow it down three or four times prior to the show here to try to see for sure and couldn't do it. Yeah. So it's a tough, uh, tough call on the field. I know they called it uh, in their defense right away. They called right. him down. They moved on. So maybe that's the best way to handle those sort of things. In our situation, they tell us that when in doubt, fumble or not, it's not. Right. So there you go. So if it's a tie, it goes to the runner, hey, basically. Basically, you're uh, correct. Kind of like baseball. Correct. Um, and just real quick then, so uh, what body parts count as being down? Is it elbow and up? Uh, well, you know, anything except the, the – you know, anything that, that touches the ground other than the hand or the foot. Okay, so a forearm? Forearm, a you're wrist. down. Okay. An ankle, down, you know, a, a shoulder, obviously, chest, knees, wherever. So uh, the hand or foot should be the only thing that will – that touches the ground that's allowed to the play to continue. Also, some people think, well, if the runner's got the ball and he touches the ball on the ground and stumbles, but that's the only thing that touches the ball and he keeps going, he would be down. No, the ball is, is, is perfectly fine there. Okay. And it's not a body part, obviously. So, you know, runner stumbles, touches the ball, keeps going. Perfectly live, live ball in, in that situation. Didn't know that. So the, the runner can hold the ball, and the ball can actually touch the ground as long as no other part of his body is. Correct. It's, it's and, still alive. And keep going. Correct. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's, yes. a, that's a Same thing here in this role. play. I mean, the, the runner was laying on top of a defender, 
And so, assuming that there was nothing other than the hand or foot touching the ground, he's still alive. Okay. He could have kept running then, Could've, too, potentially. Possibly, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to go on to the next play. This was a hold that was caught on St. Mary's. Um, I'll be honest, as an offensive lineman, I didn't think it was a, <laughs> a great call. Um, but it, I can see why the, why the official called it, because it does look like he hooked there. On the very right side of your uh, screen, um, number eight. Um, right. He – He's the wing back, I believe. He gets on a hip, and the uh, defender sort of uh, changes direction. It looks – eight's right here on the on the wing. And he just kind of pushes him did backwards. It, did he actually grab him? I, it's tough to tell from this angle. I mean, the official's standing right there looking at it. Um, that's one of those where uh, it's, it's a guess. Yeah. It's a guess. It kind of looks bad, but it may not be bad. Well, and like we said, it's easy for us now uh, watching the replay. But you know, on the field, I I, I can see it does kind of look like a hook. But right. kind of looking at it in slow motion, I'm not so sure. But right. uh, it's interesting none, nonetheless, nonetheless to to see how it's called there. So, um, the final play here was a play by Van Wert. It was a little shuffle pass. Um, you'll see the quarterback take the snap and then. Uh, start kind of an option and then throw it to his uh, running back in the front there as a shuffle pass. Right. Um, I know as somebody that I've done stats for a few years now, the shuffle passes, it's always interesting because the shuffle passes can be within six inches or a foot of the quarterback. It still counts as a pass on the still stats. Still counts as a, as a forward pass, yes. And as, as we've learned earlier in the season, there can only be one forward pass per play. So if he pitches that forward, that's considered a forward pass, and you're going to record it as such. And if that running back would have stood, you know, caught it, and then all of a sudden launched another one downfield, that would have been an illegal forward pass at that point because that would have been the second one of, of the play. Would so, a, would a, if a quarterback would hand off the ball in front of him? That's fine. It's that's not a problem to do that behind the line of scrimmage. You can hand the ball forward, sidewards, backwards. Not, it's not a big deal. But I think earlier in the, in the Wapakoneta game, there was a play where there might have been a – a second forward pass because the first one was really, really short. Right. And then the, 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 the running back then pulled up and tossed it downfield. Now, I haven't seen the clip, so I don't know. But two forward passes, even though it could be six inches, six feet, six yards, anything beyond that first one would be an illegal forward pass. The other important thing is sometimes on those little shuffle passes, the, the defender will get in the way or, or, the, or the running back will drop the ball, and that's an incomplete pass, not a fumble. That correct? is correct. That is correct. And, and sometimes it takes officials a minute to go, wait a minute, that was a forward pass. That should be incomplete. And everybody gets excited, and all of a sudden, oh, wait, yep, it was. So okay. I get it. Yep. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really close call there because there's a, only a couple inches sometimes between a little shuffle pass and right. a handoff. And it could be underhanded. It could be overhanded. It could be behind his back, between his legs. doesn't matter how you throw it, just as long as it goes forward. All right. All right. Excellent. Uh, a lot of great points there. We're going to go ahead and take another break. On the other side, we're going to look at uh, three more clips from the game. So be sure to join us. Guidari on Spring Street, home of the signature Big Ralph Sub, Pizza, and Calzone. Come try our thirst-quenching Rider Aid before, during, and after the game. Post-game live music every Friday night. It's Gwinnery's. Give them a call, 419-394-2244. And we're back here from the break. Um, now we have a couple, uh, three plays here from the Van Wert game. What's interesting, Marcus, this brings up some of the concepts that we've talked about in earlier episodes. Okay. So the first play here is a pile push. Uh, from by St. Mary's, we talked about earlier in the year. Uh, this is uh, number two, uh, Kurt Bupp, the quarterback. Um, we talked about earlier in the year that it's okay to push the entire pile as Correct. long as you're not helping the the player too much. Here's another angle of that. I just wanted to know your thoughts. Was uh, yeah, that's going to be a tough one. I mean, the officials, particularly the referee, possibly standing behind that play, must have direct knowledge that he's being. You know, number two is a quarterback with the ball carrier, um, was in fact being pushed. But the question becomes then, at what point is the contact and is the quarterback already over the goal line? You can see from, you know, from the play, it's tough to – that depth perception is, is going to be tough. Um, with all those bodies in there like that, it looks like a big rugby, rugby scrum is what it looks like. You're best to keep the flag in your pocket. Everybody knows what's happening there, but is there direct contact by one or more? can't tell from where we're standing it sort of seems kind of like you like the other play it's a if it's a if, if it's not obvious you're gonna you're gonna let it go it, let Correct. it go mm -hmm. right yep all right well that's interesting uh next 
play we have here. Uh, we talked about earlier in the earlier in this year uh, whether the clock would stop when somebody's pushed out of bounds or not. Right. So in this case, we have a Van Wert receiver, uh, kind of a short, uh, maybe five ten yard stop, catch the ball, uh, get hit by the St. Mary's receive uh, defender, and you see at just there in the right hand of your screen the uh, official keep the clock going. Right. We have another angle here showing it from the from yeah, the side just, view. Let's take a look and see if we can tell. Pass throws it. Is yeah, it, it appears that he was driven sideways. Although somebody could make a case if you looked at it really close that maybe there was uh, some some upfield movement by the, the 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 back because he has he's kind of driving upfield there. Um, too close to call, you know, in that situation. And I don't know what point this happened in the game. I think it was towards the end of the game. Yeah, I but mean, and that could be that could be a critical call if you needed the time. Right. But that was probably close enough if you're driven sideways or backwards. Progress was considered to be stopped inbounds, and therefore the clock would run. Okay, and that's the important part is if that forward progress is stopped well inbounds, we're going to keep the clock running if he's pushed out of bounds. Correct. Then. That would be a play that maybe replay could – possibly correct somewhere in another level but at the high school level that's not going to happen not yet not yet all right all right we have a final play then um just a hold um and this one's pretty obvious frankly it's uh, on saint mary's um we've you know seen some hold calls there um uh, before but uh just wanted to be able to show it. You can kind of see the jersey pulling right, there. So. Right, right, yeah. When you see jerseys being stretched, that's a pretty good sign that, that somebody's got a handful and is restricting the movement of the defender. Um, I don't know. Can can we can we possibly see that again? Just uh, some people might have missed the sure missed the play. Yep, it's going to be coming out right about. Yep, I think that he turned number him fifty. In, yep. And that looks bad there in the middle of the field, but I think that was just a pancake block there, so that's not a big deal. But, yeah, that'll, that'll come back, and it'll, it'll march 10 yards off from the spot of the foul. Okay. Yeah, so we're, getting a, we're able to see some of the, the items that we talked about earlier right. in the year. So really appreciate it there. Um, that's about all the time we have today for Super. our show. I wanted to thank you again for coming. Thank you. I wanted to encourage our uh, viewers at home, too, to send us any questions that they might have. Leave it in the comments on our Facebook page. Leave it in the comments of the YouTube video. Send us an email to our Rider Nation station. We'll go ahead and try to get anything answered for in future weeks. So yep, That would be good. Thanks for joining us again. Catch us next week for Rules of the Game. This episode of Rider Nation Station has been sponsored by American Manufacturing Solutions, your total logistic partner, investing in the St. Mary's community. Winnery's on Spring Street, home of the signature Big Ralph Sub, Pizza, and Calzone. Come try our thirst-quenching Rider Aid before, during, and after the game. Post-game live music every Friday night. It's Gwinnery's. Give them a call, 419-394-2244.